Today is the feast of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. The epistle is from the Acts of the Apostles. When the days of the Pentecost were accomplished, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind coming, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now there appeared to them parted tongues as it were of fire, and it sat upon every one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with diverse tongues, according to, as the Holy Ghost gave them to speak. Now they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded in mind, because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue. And they were all amazed and wondered, saying, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how have we heard every man our own tongue? wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya about Serene and strangers of Rome, Jews also, and proselytes, Greeks and Arabians. We heard them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Holy Gospel, we continue in the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him, and will make our abode in him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my words. And the word which you have heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things have I spoken to you, abiding with you. But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Bring all things to your mind, whatsoever I shall have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. You have heard that I said to you, I go away and I come unto you. If you love me, you would indeed be glad, because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it shall come to pass, you may believe. I will not now speak many things with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and in me he hath not anything, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father hath given me commandment, so do I. Please proceed in And Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Amen. Maria, grace, plena, et omnes tecum, benedicta tu nebus, et benedictus fructus ventis tu, Jesus. On this feast of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, we will continue talking about how, why, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost, is not part of the spirit of Vatican II. Yesterday we talked about modernism and the changes in the liturgy, catastrophe. Today we'll continue on talking on a couple topics that should convince us that the spirit of Vatican II is not from the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth. First of all, indifferentism or religious liberty. Minari vos arbitramor, the writing of Pope Gregory XVI back in 1832, is another important writing for a, it was an earlier papal warning of some of the errors, like modernism, that have taken these modern times by storm, specifically liberalism and religious indifferentism. Pope Gregory XVI refers to such lethal heresies as, quote, evils and calamities and scourges as so many perils and great dangers. Another quote, for we can say in all truth, now is the hour granted to the power of darkness. End of quote. We will notice that the magisterium, this document, which is part of the magisterium, always employs strong language to make its teaching 
as explicitly as clear as possible to have the greatest impact on those the popes would influence and guide. Pope Gregory XVI wrote these things, as we said, in 1832. Now imagine the adjectives he would use today when liberalism and religious indifferentism are not only thriving, but sweeping the whole world. It's far more greater dangerous virus than Corona. This Pope exhorts the bishops of the world and the clergy and the faithful everywhere, quote, to watch over yourselves and your doctrines as your office makes it your duty, repeating incessantly to yourselves that every novelty attempts to undermine the universal church, end of quote. Sadly, even in those days, the bishops did not heed the pontiff's warnings. Well, Gregory XVI continues, quote, this should be then the aim of your efforts and the object of a continual vigilance to guard the deposit of faith amid this vast conspiracy of impious, of impious men whom we see with the liveliest grief formed to scatter and ruin it. Another quotation, as to the bishops in particular, their duty is to remain inviolably attached to the Sea of Peter, to keep the holy deposit with scrupulous fidelity, and to feed, as far as lies in their power, the flock of God. End of quote. Now, feeding the flock of God, feeding the sheep, always had one and the same meaning. That is, feeding them with the doctrine of truth, with the truths of the faith. Even as the then most, mostly conservative and traditional bishops faltered in their chief duty, the popes were ever vigilant and watchful. Again, as Pope Leto XIII says, the history of all past ages is witness to that, is witness that the apostolic see has constantly adhered to the same doctrine, in the same sense, and in the same mind." End of quote. St. Cyprian, for example, was, for one, was appalled at the thought of a human church. Yet a human church is precisely what we see all around us today, in the Conference ch Church of Vatican II's Noah's Order Church. No longer one, holy, Catholic, apostolic, but a man-centered, community-centered institution. More democratic than dogmatic, more scattered than unified, stripped of almost everything solemn, sacred, and sublime. In a word, stripped of almost everything divine. Pope Gregory XVI next arrives at the subject of religious indifferentism. He says, quote, We now come to another and most fruitful cause of the evils which are at present afflict the church and which we so bitterly deplore. We mean indifferentism or that fatal opinion everywhere diffused by the crafts of the wicked. He, here he is referring to Freemasonry that men can, by the profession of any faith, obtain the eternal salvation of their souls." End of quote. Now, as we notice, this Pope calls this a pernicious error. And as we noted earlier, what the magisterium has deemed pernicious is, in one generation, cannot all of a sudden be noble and true and beneficial in a sub subsequent generation. As we have stressed before, when a pope ponders and then decides on a religious matter, that question is then settled. Along the same lines, we have this testimony from Pope St. Boniface I, when he said, quote, it has never been allowed that that be discussed again, which has once been decided by the apostolic see, 
end of quote. Getting back to religious liberty, concerning Vatican II's decree on religious liberty, dignitatis humanae, in addition to the papal condemnations, entire volumes have been written demonstrating how ruinous to the church and to the nations is one heresy has been, especially the writings of Archbishop Lefebvre, especially this book, they have uncrowned him. These informative works show the gravity and destructiveness of the blasphemy of religious liberty, this heresy that effectively strips our divine Lord of his kingship and expels him from his rightful domain as king of all nations, as king of kings. <coughs> In his encyclical letter called Libertas Prestantissimum on the nature of human liberty or true and false liberty, Pope Leo XIII gives us a, this explanation of religious liberty. Quote, such a liberty indeed places on the same level truth and error, faith and heresy, the church of Jesus Christ and any human institutions, whatever. It established a deplorable and deadly separation between human society and God, its author. It leads finally to the sad consequences of the state indifferentism in religious matters, or what comes to the same thing, it's atheism. End of quote. Up until Vatican II, the magisterium was completely unanimous in his condemnation of religious liberty. Here's a few more excerpts from Rome to prove our point. Pope Pius VI said in 1791 that religious liberty will, quote, annihilate the Catholic religion. In 1814, Pius VII said, quote, it is implicitly the disastrous and forever deplorable heresy Pope Gregory XVI, writing in 1832, calls it, quote, a delirium for the ruin of the church and the state. And another quote, the most deadly scourge that ravages the nations. End of quote. This is indeed very, very strong language traditionally used by the popes before Vatican II. The complete opposite of the popes after Pius XII that have come, become infected with the Vatican II virus, the spirit of liberalism and modernism. The next topic, ecumenism, was also condemned. The Catholic Church is a divine institution, divinely established, divinely commissioned. The mission of this one true church is summed up in the passage, quote, from St. Saint, Saint Matthew, Saint, sorry, St. Mark, 16, 15 to 16, Go ye into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. The Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism presumes to redefine and redirect the church's age-old mission. In speaking of the significance and importance of, in the mystery of salvation of the other churches, the Council Fathers have called into question the Catholic doctrines of the mystical body, as well as the primary, primary of one church and of no salvation outside the church. Here again, the heresies of indifferentism and religious liberty come into play. It must be understood that the many false religions of the world, all of the religions but the one founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, have not a supernatural origin, but were created by men in rebellion against God. The modern notion that the Holy Ghost will use other false dominations as a means of salvation is heresy. 
Vatican II, the non-binding pastoral council says, quote, in certain special circumstances, such as in prayer services for unity and during ecumenical gatherings, it is allowable, indeed desirable, that Catholics should join in prayer with their separated brethren. End of quote. The authentic magisterium with the final word on the subject and whose authority is binding says the very opposite. Quote from Pius, Pius the Ninth, it is clear that the apostolic see can by no means take part in these assemblies, nor is it in any ways, any ways lawful for Catholics to give to such enterprises their encouragement for, or support. If they did so, they would be giving, giving countenance to a false Christianity quite alien to the one true church of Christ. End of quote. The magisterium has spoken, the matter is settled. The Vatican II position, quite simply, is out of step with the church. Its, its position is heretical. Therefore, all the ecumenical maneuvers of the past 50 years are condemned by the magisterium and thus therefore must be rejected. Returning to the, the cyclical mirari voice by Gregory the 16th, quote, let them tremble then who imagine that every creed leads by an easy path to the port of felicity and reflect seriously on the testimony of our Savior himself that those who are against Christ, who are not with Christ, and that they miserably scatter by the fact that they gather not with him, and that consequently they will perish eternally without any doubt if they do not hold to the Catholic faith and preserve it entire and without alteration. End of quote. Since one pope can only rightfully uphold, reiterate, or more rigorous, vigorously expound, but never contradict the continual unanimous and universal teachings of his predecessors on the chair of Peter, Pope Pius IX, Pope Pius XI, echoed Gregory XVI's condemnation of religious indifferentism and his heretical offshoot, religious liberty. And again, another quotation of Pius IX in his Syllabus of Errors, 1864, quote, they do not fear to foster that erroneous opinion, especially fatal to the Catholic Church and to the salvation of souls, namely that liberty of conscience and of worship is a right proper to every man, end of quote. And in Pope Pius XI's encyclical, Mortalium Animos of 1928, and fostering true religious liberty, this Pope likewise, likewise dissected the deadly errors inherent in the modern ecumenical movement, especially in differentism and religious li liberty. Quote, now, such efforts can meet with no kind of approval among Catholics. They presuppose the erroneous view that all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy inasmuch as all give expression under various forms to that innate sense which leads men to God and to the obedient acknowledgement of his rule. Those who hold such in view are not only in error, they distort the true idea of religion and thus reject it, falling gradually into naturalism and atheism. To favor this opinion, therefore, and to encourage such undertakings is tantamount to abandoning the religion revealed by God. Evidently, therefore, no religion can be true save that which rests upon the revelation of God, a revelation begun from the very first, continued under the old law, and brought to completion by Jesus Christ himself under the new. End of quote. 
Indeed, the, pap the PPC pulls no punches in challenging and admonishing those of today who vigorously advocate interfaith worship, ecumenical assemblies, the various gatherings of the world's religions, as we have seen in the past 50 years. Are we then not to be interested in fostering religious liberty among the peoples of earth, among the peoples possessing different, differing creeds? Certainly we are. Holy Scripture has it that it is his will that all men should be saved and led to recognize the truth. The Pius IX writes, as charity demands, let us pray ceaselessly that the entire world may be converted to Christ. And let us labor as hard as we possibly can for the salvation of all men. End of quote. How then can such a desired end be achieved? Papai XI explains how in mortalium animos this can be done. Quote, it is clear why this apostolic see has never allowed its subjects to take part in assemblies of non-Catholics. There is but one way in which the unity of Christians may be fostered, and that is by furthering the return to the one true church of Christ, of those who are separated from it. For from that one true church, they have in the past fallen away. End of quote. Make no mistake about what the magisterium is telling us. The key word in any ecumenical initiative must be conversion, not dialogue. Christian unity can only mean the conversion of the separated brethren, not mere coexistence with them in some form of endless and aimless dialogue. Dialogue is devoid of charity if its aim is not to reunite men with God in a doctrine and the Church of Christ. As Pope Pius XII explains, quote, let them not think that the dissident and erring can happily be brought back to the bosom of the church if the whole truth found in the church is not sincerely taught to all without corruption. And a quote from Humani Generis. And another quotation from Pope Leo XIII, quote, let them return. Nothing indeed is dear to our heart let them return, all those who wander away from the fold of Christ. However, he explains, because all these truths which form the Holy Christian doctrine have only one author and doctor, let one beware not to subtract anything from the doctrine received from God or to omit anything for whatever reasons there might be. Because he who would do that would tend more to distance Catholics from the church rather than to bring back to the church those who are, se are separated from it. End the quote. Now, is, is not that exactly what has happened in the last 50 years? Because the doctrine of Christ was compromised at and since Vatican II, not only have those who have been separated from the church not been drawn back to her, not only have many of them been driven away, further away from her, but Catholics themselves have been increasingly distanced from her. As one Catholic writer, Atkins, summarizes the, 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 the defections, the heresies, the scandals. Those living openly in sin, divorced, remarried, indulging in sensual and material things as ends in themselves, so many who are no longer even believe in the divinity of Christ or his church, or in the real presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, or in the maternity and queenship of Mary, which we celebrate today, on the Feast of Pentecost also, in the power of prayer, or in the existence of hell, no longer even believe in sin, or in redemption, or in grace. This is the situation we live in. This is the spirit of Vatican II, which is not the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost. Therefore, on this Feast of Pentecost, but also with commemorating the Queenship of Mary, 
Let us make the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the spouse of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, to inspire the real truth into disillusioned Catholics who currently believe and act according to the evil spirit of Vatican II. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.